Well, good morning. It's very good to be at Biola. This is not my first time to Biola, and I'm very glad to be back. I had forgotten how green and beautiful your campus is, so I, I was enjoying walking around uh, this morning, and I hope to meet many of you throughout the day. I'm going to be on campus uh, most of the day. So thank you for having me here. Thank you, Chris, for those words. You know, I, I'm going to be talking about the theme of friendship this morning, spiritual friendship. And it feels very appropriate that I'm surrounded by friends here this morning. Chris uh, has been a friend, as he said, for about you know, a decade now. Uh, Misty and Matt and, and another Matt. And uh, it's, just, it's wonderful to, to have friends here who I've known for a long time. And I hope to make new friends as I'm here today as well. I'd like to pray once more as we, as we begin. So if you'd bow with me for prayer. Gracious God, I pray that you will open our minds and hearts to hear from you, to hear from your word, to see Jesus as the friend that he was and is. I pray in his name, amen. Well, I want to I wanna start this morning by telling you about a play uh, by Tom Stoppard. Some of you will know the name Tom Stoppard. He's probably most famous, I guess, for the play Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead, um, which some of you know, uh, hopefully. Um, he he co-wrote Shakespeare in Love, so he's, you know, he's a well-known playwright. This, this play that I want to talk about this morning is one of perhaps his lesser-known uh, works. It's called The Invention of Love, and it's about the life of the poet and text critic A.E. Hausman, um, who died in 1936. Um, he was quite famous for a collection of poems, A Shropshire Lad. And it was several years ago. I, I was you know, coming to terms with, with my own same-sex attraction, which I'll say a little bit more about later. Um, and a friend of mine said, have you read The Invention of Love by Tom Stoppard? And I hadn't even heard of it. So immediately I, I ordered it and, and read it. And I, I, I discovered why he said you should, you should read this play and think about this play in relation to your life and your questions. Um, in, in the middle of the play is a scene where A.E. Hausman meets his departed self. So he's in his 20s. He's a student at Oxford at the time of this scene in the middle of the play. And he meets the older deceased version of himself who's lived his whole life. And now they get to have a conversation. Fascinating scene. Um, and, and the younger Hausman is, is beginning to come to terms with his own homosexuality. And he's really asking himself the question in the Oxford of his day, what does it look like to be true to this part of myself? What, 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 how should I love? How should I, how should I express my longings? And what he finds himself doing in this scene is, is he's reaching back for examples from the classical past, you know, the, the, the Greek and the Roman past, these kind of noble ideals of same-sex friendship, comradeship in arms, you know, the sacred band of Thebes and all that. And he's, he's sort of waxing eloquent about how much easier it was for a man to love another man centuries ago. And he says, if you try to do that today in Oxford, you get into trouble. But, but, but back then, in the past, in this, in this kind of classical vision of friendship, you could, you could give your life for another man, and it was honorable. It was something that was esteemed, something that was understood in the culture. There was a category for thinking about same-sex love, and he finds himself uh, describing this you know, in eloquent terms. And his, his older cynical self, his, his dead self, says to him in reply, you know, that, that won't work. Love will not be deflected from its mischief so easily. And so you get this fascinating back and forth of these, these two housemans having a conversation about what it means to have desire to love another man. What, how should that be interpreted? How should that be expressed? How should it not be expressed? How should it be acknowledged and lived into and, and, and celebrated, but also recognized as a potentially dangerous and potentially problematic desire? So that's right in the middle of this play. And here I am, you know, with my own questions, my own, my own yearnings, and I'm reading this play, and I'm thinking, that's exactly my question. As a Christian, I, I, I grew up in a Christian family, and I knew that I wanted to remain a Christian. I wanted to remain faithful to Scripture. But yet I knew that I had a, a nearly exclusive attraction 
to persons of my own sex. And my burning question at the time that I opened this play was, how do I hold these things together? What does it mean to live as a faithful disciple of Jesus with a, with a homosexual orientation? What does it mean to be, to be gay or to be same-sex attracted or whatever term you prefer to use? What does it mean to be that in relation to the, to the lordship of Jesus? That was my question. It, d- d- does it simply mean I'm called to deny this, this love, this yearning, this longing for, for intimacy with men? Or is there some way, like Hausman hints at in this scene, the younger Hausman hints at, of, of offering it to be transformed, to be deepened, to be ennobled in the life of faith? What does it look like for someone who is attracted to members of their own sex, to find, to find their love not simply, not simply denied or ignored, but somehow transformed, somehow sanctified, somehow offered to God. So what I wanna do this morning, just in the time that we have left, is I, I wanna share with you um, some, of the, some of the things that I've been thinking about lately that have kind of been prompted by, by reading Stoppard and some other sources. As, as Chris said, I'm, you know, I'm working on a, on a project about this, a writing project about friendship, and I just wanna share with you some of the fruits of that, and I wanna share it in the form of, of three commitments that I think all of us as, as believers in Christ could make that would, I think, significantly strengthen our lives as, as church communities, our lives as a, as a campus community, our lives as individual disciples. Three commitments we might make that would begin to alter the way we think about same-sex love, the way we think about friendship, the way we think about how we, how we love one another in the body of Christ. And the, the way I wanna, I wanna do this, I wanna preface it by, by talking just, just for a moment about why this question feels so urgent to me and why this feels so important. Why would I, why would I come and devote uh, a, a chapel talk to this question of friendship? And it has to do, as, as I said at the beginning, with, with, with the reality of same-sex attraction. I'm, I'm, I've done a few events like this in recent months, and I'm meeting a lot of people uh, who are your age, who are sitting where, where you sit now, or who, or who have recently graduated from an institution like this, and they're filled with questions about what it means that they, they know they don't want to abandon their faith. They know they don't want to give up on following Christ, but they also know they don't fit into the category of straight. They, they don't fit into the category of heterosexual, and they're wondering, what does discipleship look like in, the, in, that, in that reality? What does it look like to be faithful? What does it look like not simply to be faithful, but to be, to be whole, to be, to be healthy, to be flourishing in the body of Christ? Jesus said that he came to offer life and to offer it abundantly. And the question you may be asking this morning, the question I, I have friends who are asking, the question I'm asking, is what does it look like to find uh, a life of, of, of beauty, a life of love, a life of, of, of humane flourishing in the body of Christ as a same-sex attracted Christian? I received an email from a friend recently, and I've, I've asked his permission if I can share an excerpt of this, because I think, he, I think he puts really poignantly the question I want you to feel. The question, if you're not asking it, certainly someone you know is likely asking it. Here's what he says. He says, what I cannot imagine, what causes me to wince in terror is the thought of being celibate in my 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond. Perhaps I lack your strength or contentment for celibacy. Perhaps I've not experienced the relational support to joyfully pursue a vocation of celibacy. Whatever the case, I'm profoundly restless so restless that at times I feel like I'm suffocating under the burden of it. Call it weakness, I just need to be needed. And not needed by a friend who closes the distance with a phone call, a drive, or a flight. I need to be needed by a companion who is there when I return from work, there when I walk in the park, there when I prepare a meal for dinner, there when I read from a book out loud, there when I go to bed, there when I wake up, there when I cry or laugh, there when I'm sick. In short, I desire a covenantal relationship where my helper and I witness each other's moments of being. 
to use Virginia Woolf's lovely expression. Otherwise, I dread the thought of having those moments forever unwitnessed. Sure, God witnesses my moments of being, but that's not enough. I need the face of God in a watchful and loving human face. Do you hear the, do you hear the urgency there? He, he, he's, he's feeling that God is calling him to celibacy. He feels that this is what it means to be faithful to the, to the revelation we've been given in Scripture. And yet he, he's acknowledging there's a, there's a pain there. There's a loneliness there. There's an isolation. And he's asking, what does is, what is health look like? What does flourishing look like in that kind of difficult road of discipleship? That's the question I'm asking. I, I, I won't go into all my story. You can, you can maybe pick up my book if you're interested in the long version. But I, I realized at a young age that I was, I was you know, exclusively attracted to, to mem- members of my own sex. I'd grown up in a Christian family, two loving Christian parents. I had a wonderful youth group that I was part of in high school. And yet I somehow felt that this, this area of my life was so, was so shameful that it ought to be kept a secret. And so I, it wasn't until I went to Wheaton and met people like Chris that I began to learn to open up this, this part of my life, this part of my story, to the healing light of the gospel and began to wrestle with these questions in community. And my questions sound, sounded very much like that email I just read to you. And in some ways, still today, they sound like that email. So what I want to do in the, time, in the time we have left is I want to share with you three commitments we might make as a church, three commitments we might make as individual followers of Christ that would speak into the life of someone like my friend who wrote that email or someone like your friend or someone like you. First thing I think we could do as a church is to recognize the need for friendship, same-sex friendship, to be elevated and strengthened. It's very easy to find examples of the word friend in our culture. I mean, the most obvious example is the way it has now become a verb, thanks to Facebook, to friend someone on Facebook. And, and you know, we, we, have, we have these ways of kind of casually throwing the term around. And, and you know, it's, it's, it, our culture's saturated with it. But I think we also recognize, many of us, that that, that, that version of friendship that, that our culture gives to us, that, that we've kind of unthinkingly imbibed, is actually in many ways not a very rich um, um, conception of friendship. I mean, most of us wouldn't think anything at all about you know, having a friend that we, that we enjoy hanging out with, but then you know, if, if another job comes along or a, or, a, or a better opportunity comes along, we'll quickly move. And, 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 and you know, we'll, we'll hopefully keep in touch by email and Twitter and all these things, but, 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 but there's, not a, there's not a deep bond to it. Likewise, I think, when, when you think about what we choose to invest honor in in the church, if you think about marriage, we have, we have, a, we have a public ceremony, you know, a kind of sacramental rite, where we say, you know, this, this bond is so important uh, and it's sanctioned by God that we're going to honor it publicly and we're going to invite the whole church family to come and witness these vows in order that they can be there to strengthen the vows and to make sure the couple has the support they need to be faithful to those vows. We elevate the love of parents and children. We often find you know, retreats and programs in our churches that are aimed at strengthening the nuclear family and I think that's all to the good. But the point is, you know, we, we, we have all these mechanisms to recognize many different forms of love in the body of Christ, and friendship can too often easily slide off the map. Friendship is not something we think of as, 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 as worth elevating and strengthening in that way. And I remember when I first ran across uh, a, a very kind of um, short and, and perhaps somewhat obscure treatise from the medieval era written by Aylred of Riveau, uh, an abbot in the, in, the, in the north of England in Yorkshire at Riveau Abbey. And he writes this dialogue on spiritual friendship. And I remember having to close the book and just, just set it aside and think about it for a while when he said, a friend, a spiritual friend, your same-sex friend that you're related to in the, in the monastery is someone that you should be willing to go to the cross for. And what struck me about that when I closed the book is that's the language we normally reserve for marriage in most of our churches. That's the language that we tend to reserve for a parent or child bond. We don't tend to think that way about friendship. What would it mean if we did begin to think that way about friendship? If your friend was someone that that you, you recognize the need 
to elevate this love, to, to, to strengthen this love. He said, you know, this, this person that I've gotten close to over these last four years at Biola, th- this is not someone I'm willing to let go when I graduate. This is a friendship I'm going to look for ways to strengthen. And I'm going to ask my church community, my friend community, to recognize that love and validate that love and help me strengthen that love. That's the first thing I would, I would say we could do as, as churches, as communities, that might, that might actually give some hope to people like me, to people like my email correspondent. The second thing I think we might do is, is to recognize the need, if friendship is going to be strengthened and elevated and honored, it, it needs some kind of promise, promissory element or, or commitment involved in it. And again, we, we recognize this very easily with marriage. You know, we, we, we recognize there's, there's, there's uh, God has given us sanction in Ephesians 5 and Matthew 19 and other places for this particular bond to be, to be recognized, to be elevated, to be honored in the church. I mean, the, the writer to the Hebrew says, let the marriage bed be held in honor in the church. And I think we're absolutely right to do that. Whether, whether we're right to do marriages, to do wedding ceremonies in the way we often do them is another question. I have my, I have my uh, questions about whether we ought to strengthen marriages in, in, in perhaps different ways than, than we're often uh, used to strengthening them. But nonetheless, you know, we recognize if this, if this bond is going to be significant in the lives of these two people in the way that it needs to be, it needs to be a promise. It needs to be a covenant. It needs to be a sealed commitment. And I wonder what it might mean if we began to think of other relationships as, as in need of not identical promises, not, 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 uh, not marriage vows per se, but, but some kind of element where two people are able to say to one another, or more than two people, we are so concerned to be in one another's Christian lives that we won't simply say that, but we will, we will actually make promises that, that, that require some kind of sacrifice of us. My own experience in this is, I, you know, as Chris said, I did my graduate work in England. Um, and, and one of the great gifts of my time in England was friendship, actually. I spent four years in Durham, and uh, I remember one night, I was, I was standing in my kitchen, and I was washing dishes, and my phone rang, and so I you know, wiped the suds off my hand and answered the phone, and it was my friend, Jono. And he said, you know, I, I, have, a, I have a serious question I wanna ask you, and so I you know, sat down and, and said, okay, fire away. And he said, I, I, I wanna ask if you would consider being the godfather of our daughter. Uh, there, there was a, a daughter that had been born to Jono and Megan uh, while we were in graduate school together. And I said, you know, I didn't want to answer right away because I knew this is a very serious thing. This is about making promises at Callie's baptism to make a lifelong commitment to being there to strengthen her faith in Christ and to speak into her life. And I said, I said, uh, well, let me, let me pray about it. And I called Jono back um, a, a couple of days later and, and said, you know, I, 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 really, I really would um, like to say yes to this. And I, I wanna share with you just a little bit of, of what I ended up writing to Jono to thank him uh, for, for this honor. I said, not being married myself or having kids, I've often thought of Jesus' words to Peter when Peter says, see, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus replies, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. And then I said this to Jono. I take comfort from this, that in Jesus' economy, leaving the prospect of being a husband and father myself does not mean being without a family. Surely part of what Jesus means is that in following him, we discover a new family. In the church, I, as a single person, can have new brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and children. I can say that I'm very happy and very honored that part of God surrounding me with new family is his bringing you two and your kids into my life. And I think what, what happened in subsequent weeks and months, now years, is, is 
Jono and Megan and I begin to recognize this isn't simply about drawing me into Callie's life, but it's about drawing me into their family's life. It's about recognizing if our friendship is going to be elevated and strengthened in the way that we want it to be, it needs to have a promissory element built into it. It needs to have me standing there at Callie's baptism saying, I promise in the sight of this, of this church community that I will stand with her as she grows and I'll stand with her parents as they try to raise her in the, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Well, thirdly and finally, I think we can recognize, we can make a commitment in the church to recognize that these kind of friendships that I'm talking about have the potential for grace and blessing beyond themselves. They have the potential to bless and, and enrich the life of the family of God. As I've been, as I've been doing my, my research on, on, on friendship for, for this book that I'm writing, one of the fascinating texts that I've discovered is, is, a, is a text written by a, a, a Russian genius named Pavel Florinsky. And it's, it's a collection of letters. It's a, it's a massive book, but it's, it's 12 letters uh, that, that he wrote on, on Eastern Orthodox theology. And, and one of the letters is all about friendship. And one of the things Florinsky does in those letters is he uses the metaphor of a molecular bond to talk about how friends, pairs of friends, are related to the wider body of Christ. He says, if you think about the church, you know, we can't know everyone in the church, we can't be immediately related to everyone in the church, but what we can do is think of the relationships in which we're already involved, relationships like me with Jono and Megan, for instance, we can think of those as, as building blocks or molecular bonds that in a sense work to hold the whole body of Christ together and in that way enrich and strengthen the wider body of Christ. I think that's such a suggestive way of thinking about friendship is not simply meant to be to turn the partners in on themselves and be exclusive, but it's meant to be a bond that strengthens the partners and teaches the partners about what it might mean to love beyond the circle of the friendship. You know, there have been many people in the history of the church who've been very worried about friendship for precisely that reason, that it, that it is something that, that becomes ingrown, it becomes exclusive, it becomes narrow. And there, there, there's, a, there's a letter that I've come to love from, uh, or, or rather a, a sermon that I've come to love from John Henry Newman, uh, the, the, the famous um, Anglican convert to Catholicism. And he addresses this issue, and he sounds a lot like Florinsky when he says, there have been men before now who've supposed that Christian love was so diffusive as not to admit of concentration upon individuals so that we ought to love all men equally. So in other words, he's saying, you know, as you read through the Christian past, you, you encounter a lot of suspicion of friendship. Friendship is not something we're supposed to invest in because we Christians are called to love everybody, including our enemies. So there's no room for this kind of, this kind of vowed, committed friendship of the kind that I'm, that I'm talking about. And Newman continues, many there are who without bringing forward any theory yet consider practically that the love of many is something superior to the love of one or two. And these people neglect the charities of private life while busy in the schemes of an expansive benevolence or of affecting a general union and conciliation among Christians. So Newman is saying, that's the, that's the opinion that's out there. And now listen to how he responds to it. He says, now I shall here maintain, in opposition to such notions of Christian love, and with our Savior's pattern before me. And he's thinking of the pattern like we had read to us. Jesus is so deeply uh, committed to these friends of his, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, that the only time we see him deeply moved to the point of tears is in that passage in the Gospels. And, and, the, and the conclusion, you heard it read this morning, the conclusion that the people who are standing around come to is see how much he loved them. That's the love of friendship they're talking about. That's, that's what kind of love it was. So with our Savior's pattern before me, Newman says, the best preparation this is what he maintains. The best preparation for loving the world at large and loving it duly and wisely is to cultivate an intimate friendship and affection towards those who are immediately about us. In other words, he's saying, if you hope to love your enemy, 
if you hope to love beyond your own charmed circle, as you should, that's what Christ calls us to do, one of the ways in which you can begin to learn to do that is to love the neighbor whom God has already brought into your life, to love that friend like Mary or Martha or Lazarus that God has brought into your life. And Newman says, I can have confidence that that may be the case because I'm looking at the pattern of Christ. I'm looking at the pattern that scripture has laid out for us. This is what friendship looks like. It's honored, it's esteemed, it's written into the pages of the fourth gospel. It's there for the taking, it's there for the rediscovering for us. So that's what I'd like to leave us with this morning. I'd, li I'd like to leave you with, with um, the, the, the invitation to consider making these three commitments in your own way. I don't know how it might look for you. I can begin to imagine some of the ways in which it might look on a campus like this where you're surrounded by people who I hope will be your lifelong friends, but I don't know. I would invite you to think creatively, think outside the box. Think in conversation with the rich heritage of the Christian tradition. There is so much in the Christian tradition about friendship that we've simply forgotten. Blow the dust off those sources and rediscover this love. I don't know what it might look like for you, but I would encourage you as you leave chapel today to think about what way you might recognize the need for your friendships to be elevated and strengthened. Could you make a commitment to recognize the need for promises in your friendships? Not casual bonds, but promises. And could you also make a commitment to begin to recognize the potential in those friendships for grace and blessing beyond your own immediate circle. So that you might begin to think of your vocation as I'm called to strengthen the body of Christ. I'm called to love beyond the borders of the body of Christ. I'm called to love even my enemies by beginning to learn what it means to love in this friendship or friendships that God has given me. I don't have any illusions that this will solve the question of loneliness for gay Christians. It's a question I continue to return to in my life. I don't have any illusions that this is a kind of magic bullet solution to the question of same-sex attraction that, that you're wrestling with, that many of our churches and denominations are wrestling with, but what I do feel is that that conversation would look different. The questions we ask would look different. The questions would, would be deeper and richer if we brought to the conversation a rich, robust theology of friendship, if we recognize with our Savior's pattern before us, as Newman says, that friendship is a genuine love in its own right. It's a love worth honoring. It's a love worth celebrating. It's a love, as Aylred said, that would be willing to go all the way to the cross. Would you bow with me for prayer? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the friend who went to the cross to make us your friends. May you now make us friends of one another. May we discover new depths of friendship with one another as we follow your cruciform life. We pray in your name, amen. Go in peace. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.